Maths is already fantastic. You'd be hard-pressed to dream up anything as outrageous as different sizes of infinity, or shapes in 56 dimensions. Write a story in which a ball is cut apart and then reassembled to make two balls each as big as the original, and it'd seem far-fetched, except that it's a genuine mathematical result. Even the characters and incidents you might contrive to bring into a math novel couldn't be more outlandish than some of those in real life. Maths often finds its way into fiction because it's so fantastic and makes for a good plot device. At other times, an invented story serves to explain some aspect of maths or to speculate where maths might lead in the future. Scientists who write science fiction such as Carl Sagan and Fred Hoyle have put forward ideas in their stories that lie far beyond the bounds of established fact, ideas they may have been reluctant to air in professional circles. In the same way, authors have used tales of the imagination to explore possible new realms of mathematics. Isaac Asimov based his Foundation trilogy on the premise that a future field of maths called psychohistory could accurately foretell the actions of large groups of people. In no branch of science has a major breakthrough first been widely and accurately disseminated in a work of fiction, but this has happened in the case of number theory. Computer scientist Donald Knuth in his novel, Surreal Numbers, How Two Ex-Students Turned On to Mathematics and Found Total Happiness, was the first published work to describe an important new system of numbers discovered by John Horton Conway. The ploy of explaining scientific ideas in a fictional context, though, is an old one and crops up regularly in what may be thought of as a subcategory of science fiction mathematical fiction. As long ago as 414 BC, maths appears in a comedy called The Birds by the Greek playwright Aristophanes. At one point, an actor portraying the geometer Meton of Athens comes on stage carrying some surveying instruments and explains, With the straight ruler I set to work to inscribe a square within this circle. In its centre will be the marketplace into which all the straight streets will lead, converging to this centre like a star, which although only orbicular, sends forth its rays in a straight line from all its sides. Fast forward to 1666 and maths pops up again in one of the earliest works of science fiction and possibly the earliest written by a woman. In a passage of The Blazing World by Margaret Cavendish, Duchess of Newcastle, the heroine of the tale is being introduced to some of the inhabitants of another planet. Two of the intelligent species there, the lice men and the spider men, turn out to be excellent mathematicians and keen to explain their achievements. Some sixty years later in Gulliver's Travels, Jonathan Swift describes the encounter between the protagonist and the Laputians, who are interested in only two things, mathematics and music. Such is the depth of their obsessions that all their food is served in the shape of either a mathematical figure or a musical instrument. The Victorian era saw a rapid growth in the appearance of maths in fictional settings. In 1852, Charles Kingsley, author of the children's classic The Water Babies, wrote an entire novel about the life of Hypatia, the first female mathematician whose work is reasonably well recorded. As science fiction became established as a distinct genre, at a time of rising industrialization and popular interest in scientific and engineering breakthroughs, so maths began to seep through more and more into the works of authors such as Edgar Allan Poe, Edward Page Mitchell, and Jules Verne. Among the most mathematical writers was Charles Dodgson, better known by his pseudonym Lewis Carroll, 
who had a first-class degree in maths from Oxford and later became a lecturer in the subject at Christchurch. The second half of the 19th century was an exceptionally fertile time in mathematics. Radically new ideas were fast evolving in areas like non-Euclidean geometry, abstract algebra, and complex numbers. Not surprisingly, given that he lived at a time of such intellectual flux, Carroll's books are filled with colourful mathematical allusions and challenges to conventional ways of thinking. Although generally considered a mathematical conservative more at home with Euclid's elements than the seismic shifts in the subject taking place all around him, Carroll still comes across as a bohemian in spirit. What's the difference between a raven and a writing desk, the Mad Hatter asks Alice. When challenged, the Hatter admits he has no clue. I think you might do something better with the time than wasting it in asking riddles that have no answers, replies the exasperated Alice. Puzzle enthusiast Sam Lloyd came up with his own solution to the riddle. Poe wrote on both. As for Carroll himself, so often was he quizzed about the real answer that he finally invented one. Because it can produce a few notes, though they are very flat, and it is never put with the wrong end first. Unfortunately, before his explanation appeared in print, a proofreader, unaware that Carroll had intentionally written Nevar, Raven in reverse, spelling it N-E-V-A-R, corrected the spelling so that some of the original wit was lost. Carroll interspersed his fantasy writings with factual books on maths and so began a trend that's continued to this day. Among his strictly mathematical works are A Syllabus of Plain Algebraic Geometry, 1860, and Symbolic Logic, published posthumously. Often he combined fact and fiction in an informal and playful style, as in The Game of Logic, 1887, in which he explains logical propositions and inferences by way of a board game. In Euclid and His Modern Rivals, A Tangled Tale of 1879, Carroll argued that the 2,000-year-old Elements was still the best text for teaching geometry, this wasn't a controversial claim in mid-Victorian times, given that Euclid's classic treatise was second only to the Bible in the number of editions published since its first European printing in 1482. But Carroll's defence was unusual in that it took the form of a play featuring Euclid's ghost and the fictional characters Minos and Dr. Niemand. Carroll's last novel, published in two parts, Sylvie and Bruno, 1889, and Sylvie and Bruno Concluded, 1893, was a mixture of fairy tale and social commentary. In the second book, the characters discuss, over tea, how to make a projective plane by gluing the edge of a disc to that of a Mobius band, a convoluted digression that probably contributed to the book's lukewarm reception. In the same era, one of the great early popularizations of mathematics was penned by English schoolteacher and theologian Edwin Abbott. In reality, Abbott's main goal in writing Flatland, A Romance in Many Dimensions, 1884, was to comment on the gross inequalities in Victorian society, especially with regard to women, its hierarchy being reflected in the geometry of Flatland's inhabitants. The females were mere lines and the lower class males acute angled triangles. Males of greater social standing took the form of equilateral triangles and, of greater importance still, polygons with more and more sides until they were almost indistinguishable from the highly regarded shape, the circle. The enduring popularity of the book, however, is due to its user-friendly introduction to the maths of different numbers of dimensions, rather than to its now dated satire and cultural allegory. The spirit and theme of Abbott's original Flatland have been explored further by other authors right up to the present day. 
A.K. Dudeney's The Planiverse, 1984, takes the ideas of Flatland to a new level, but not dimensionality, by imagining what science and engineering would be like in a 2D world. Dudeney, a Canadian mathematician and computer scientist, begins his tale with a class of computer science students attempting to simulate what life in two dimensions would be like, complete with workable physical laws and a functioning ecosystem. They're startled to receive a message via the computer from an inhabitant of the Planiverse, who calls himself Y-N-D-R-D, pronounced by the students as Yendwed, Dudney, spelled backwards. They go on to learn all about the goings-on in Yendwed's world, from the way digestive tracts work in creatures that to us are mere plan views, to the types of molecules that are possible when one of our normal dimensions is missing. Mathematician and prolific author of popular maths books Ian Stewart wrote Flatterland, published in 2001, which he explicitly intended as a sequel to Abbott's classic, albeit published more than a century later. His imagined narrator is the granddaughter of A Square, a member of the educated cast of gentlemen and professionals through whose voice Abbott told the original tale. Less dense, far shorter, and indeed barely mathematical at all, is Norton just as The Dot and the Line, a romance in lower mathematics, 1963. Written for children, it tells the story of a straight line who falls hopelessly in love with a beautiful dot. The dot, however, has eyes only for less sensible fellows in the form of squiggles, until our hero learns all about angles and manages to transform himself into far more interesting and alluring shapes. A couple of years after it was published, The Dot and the Line was adapted into a 10-minute short film by famed animator Chuck Jones for Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, narrated by the English actor Robert Morley, Almost verbatim from the book, it won the 1965 Academy Award for Animated Short Film and was one of only two animations released by MGM that weren't Tom and Jerry cartoons. At the opposite end of the difficulty scale from the dot and the line was Charles Howard Hinton's An Episode of Flatland, 1907. Hinton was a curious and colourful character, Briefly a bigamist, inventor of an ingenious but dangerously unreliable baseball gun, and lifelong obsessive about higher dimensions. Hinton wrote several books and essays on the fourth dimension, and even devised a collection of coloured wooden blocks, sold commercially, and by which he claimed he taught himself to see in 4D. In an episode of Flatland, however, he descends a dimension to the plain world of Astria. Borrowing heavily from Abbott in overall concept, he does a better job of explaining the physics of his 2D world, though the plot is tedious, and the characters unremittingly flat. <laughs>